Hello, everybody, um, and welcome back. I'm sorry to keep the breaks a bit short, but I know some some of you have got to get back sort of vaguely on, on time. So we're going to try and do this. Now, um, we've got two speakers in the next session, which is broadly speaking about working in Asia and with Asia in, in different sorts of ways. So the subplot here really is so that you can see what other people have done and what might practically lie in front of you. Um, and so each speaker will do about 15 minutes and then we'll take questions after that because there may well be different answers to the same question. I think it's better doing it that way than questions after each presentation. And our first speaker is Nick Hinton, who grew up in Asia. He actually studied here at SOAS. He's a colonel in the Gurkhas, served all over the world with them, but mostly in the Far East, and then worked for IBM in India and China. And as happens, if I might say it as one advances in life, is now trustee of various charities and organisations working in Nepal. Nick, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Adrian. Uh, if you uh, if you talk to uh, any lady, uh, she will tell you that one of the easiest ways to make a man happy is just to get him to talk about himself. <laughs> so I hope it goes without saying that I'm delighted to be here today uh, to talk about myself and specifically uh, about uh, my work and experiences that I've had in Asia. Now, I'm, I'm pretty ancient, so I could bang on for hours about uh, uh, all the things that I've done, but I'm not going to. I only have about 15 minutes. So what I'm going to do is just to gallop quickly through uh, some of my experiences uh, and try and draw out of those uh, some points of uh, interest and some uh, insights that uh, you may find uh, valuable. So I started off uh, very young. As a toddler, in fact, uh, and as Adrian mentioned, uh, I lived with uh, my parents in uh, Singapore. Uh, I don't remember a great deal about it, obviously enough, but uh, I do remember uh, the beautiful uh, jacaranda trees, the beautiful purple trees in our garden, and uh, also my, uh, my lovely Ama, the uh, uh, nanny who looked after me, a Chinese lady called uh, Ame, uh, who... Uh, made my life uh, absolute paradise on earth. Uh, and uh, that lasted for uh, two or three years. And then uh, I moved with my parents to the Middle East. And uh, we lived in uh, various countries around the Middle East. And uh, I think that was also a very salutary experience. Uh, to some extent, um, we lived in an expatriate bubble, as you might expect. Uh, but at the same time, my parents were quite enlightened uh, for the times, and we're talking about the late 50s and early 60s, uh, in that uh, they and I uh, had perhaps more interaction with the local population uh, than many others. And uh, so I got to play with, uh, play with local, local children, and uh, there's some lovely pictures in the family albums of uh, me playing out in the desert with, uh, with Bedouin children. Uh, and I'm told that at one point I actually spoke better Arabic than I spoke English. Long since lost, I have to say. Uh, but it was a, an interesting experience. And I think uh, to some extent sort of set my um, aspirations and interests uh, for, for the future. Um, but then uh, when I was about 10 years old, I was packed off to boarding school back in this country. Uh, and uh, some people say that they actually liked their school days. Uh, and perhaps some of you are enjoying them. Uh, I didn't. My, my abiding memory is of uh, appalling teaching by uh, extremely old uh, uh, teachers in their 70s and 80s, most of them dating from before the Second World War. Uh, I remember disgusting food. I remember being perpetually cold and being herded out onto sports pitches in the driving snow and uh, icy rain to... Uh, to play uh, rugby and hockey and so on. And uh, of course, being thrashed within an inch of my life, which is what happened at boarding schools in those days. But it was character building stuff. And uh, so when I eventually finished with school, I was able to move on uh, and join the army, uh, which was a great improvement. 
Now, Sandhurst, to some extent, was a, um, a, a sort of replica of boarding school. And um, I, uh, after I was commissioned from there, I went uh, into, the, uh, into the parachute regiment. Now, uh, at that stage, and we're talking about the very early 70s, uh, the Northern Ireland emergency was in uh, full flow. And so uh, I found myself on a sort of conveyor belt between uh, sunny Aldershot uh, and Ulster. And so I was going Aldershot, Northern Ireland, Aldershot, Northern Ireland, Aldershot, Northern Ireland, uh, which was not a great deal of fun. Uh, and so I was very lucky that uh, after about 18 months of that and bouncing backwards and forwards, um, I went off with, uh, with my regiment uh, to Oman, where um, they were just sort of putting the finishing touches to the uh, Dofar War. Uh, the insurrection in the southern part of Oman. Uh, and um, that reminded me that there was actually a lot more to the world than Northern Ireland and Aldershot. And so on the strength of that, I decided to transfer to the Gurkhas, which was probably one of the best decisions in my life I ever made. Uh, I'll come back to that in a moment, because at more or less the same sort of time that I made that decision, uh, the army offered me the opportunity to go to university. And believe it or not, uh, I came here to SOAS and uh, I read uh, Indonesian and Malay studies. Uh, it was a revelation. Uh, I have to say, uh, I uh, enormously enjoyed it and it opened my eyes to the wonderful richness and diversity of history, and culture in that part of the world. I went and spent about uh, two, of, uh, two, two terms out of what it was, nine, uh, in uh, the University of Jogjakarta in central Java, uh, which really brought home to me uh, what that part of the world is all about. Now, I don't know, probably some of you know more about Indonesia and uh, uh, Malaysia than I do. But at the time, uh, I wasn't aware of the amazing uh, number of cultural influences that uh, Malaysia and Indonesia had. Uh, the fact that uh, you know, the Straits of Malacca, uh, sort of main um, uh, path of uh, commerce and business, runs through the center of that area, meant that all these diverse influences uh, had ha, have had an impact, which meant that, in a way, Indonesia and Malaysia are microcosms of the um, culture, society, and history of what goes on in the whole of Asia, uh, which I'm most grateful for, because it meant that uh, not only did I learn about uh, those parts of the world and learn the languages and so on, uh, but I also get a far broader education of what that part of the world is all about and how it works, and by extension, good insights into what happened worldwide. So I count myself uh, enormously lucky. Uh, I also very much enjoyed my time in, uh, in Indonesia. Uh, I was fortunate to live in a house on the other side of the road from uh, a gamelan school. Now, for those of you who've, who've not heard the word before, gamelan is the uh, Indonesian percussion uh, orchestra. Uh, it's, uh, it has a wonderful sort of tinkling sound. It's made up of uh, gongs and cymbals and uh, a few drums. It, it's the most wonderfully therapeutic sound. And if you haven't heard it, look it up on the, on the net and uh, you'll be able to uh, see what I mean. So I was uh, staying in a place with the uh, gamelan music on the other side of the road, uh, which woke me up every morning and, and uh, soothed me to sleep every evening. Absolutely fabulous. Uh, I also spent uh, more time than I should have done uh, going down to the bazaar uh, to watch the uh, the Wayan Coolidge, the shadow play, uh, with all the wonderful stories from the great Hindu epics like the Mahabharata and the Ramayana, uh, with uh, their, their cast of uh, larger than life characters, all carefully manipulated uh, on the shadow screen by the Dalang, the, uh, the puppet master. And I used to, they usually took place uh, overnight, so I quite often found myself going back home at uh, sort of five or six in the morning, having been up all night, uh, watching these wonderful stories. Uh, so uh, that was all very much uh, to the good. 
however, uh, my time there did bring home to me as well uh, that uh, just as in our culture, there are downsides, so too there are in that part of the world. Uh, there is, uh, and there was, and still is, um, uh, a lot of poverty. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of uh, corruption. And also there's a dark side uh, because of the, uh, the way their society is constructed. And, and only a few years previously to my going there, um, there had been uh, an extraordinary uh, episode uh, which uh, goes by the rather sinister Indonesian acronym of Gestapo, Gestapo. And Gestapo stands for, in Indonesian, Gerakan September Tigopulu, which means the 30th of September movement, which is when it took place in 1965. And uh, it was a, a very complicated set of coups and counter coups involving all sorts of different segments of the Indonesian population. And sadly, it resulted in the most enormous bloodletting in 1965. Uh, with literally hundreds of thousands of Indonesians being killed, mostly by their neighbours who were settling scores. But there was a distinct racial element to it as well, in that they were killing off a lot of uh, Chinese, uh, because in many cases the Indonesians owed the Chinese a lot of money, and they thought by killing them their debts would be written off. So there's a most extraordinary complex of really dreadful things going on in the 60s. And uh, actually going there and talking to some of the people who'd experienced that brought home to me that in societies of that sort, there can be uh, a, quite a, a grim underside to all the very pleasant and attractive aspects that superficially appear. So that was an important lesson. Uh, so back to the Gurkhas. Um, when I finished at uh, uh, university, I uh, went back to join my regiment and uh, I uh, joined them in uh, Hong Kong initially. Uh, it was uh, an enormous privilege. The regiment I joined had been raised in uh, 1815 in the wake of the uh, Anglo-Nepalese War, 1814 to 1816, uh, in which the British were hugely impressed by the Gurkhas. In fact, for most of that war, uh, the Gurkhas were winning. Uh, and it was only latterly, and particularly as the result of one particular British general who, who uh, knew what he was doing, uh, that the British got the upper hand and the, eventually in the Treaty of Segali, the uh, uh, arrangements were put in place, part of which was that Gurkhas would be employed in the British Army. Uh, and so uh, I was the beneficiary of that legacy. Uh, and so, um, you know, 180 years later, I joined uh, that regiment who had already established themselves uh, with a very uh, strong and admirable reputation for war fighting. Uh, more importantly, perhaps, uh, from the point of view of uh, sharing an experience with you, uh, I learned a huge amount from Gurkhas, really on two counts. Uh, first was just militarily. Now, I've been pretty well educated uh, going through Sandhurst and doing various other training courses and so on. Uh, but um, Gurkhas are quintessential soldiers. They're extremely tough. Uh, they're very determined. Uh, and uh, above all, they have um, a, a, a good nature, uh, which actually brings a, a very uh, good sense of values to what they're doing in a war. Uh, I mean, to give you an example of that, uh, during the uh, um, uh, rebellion of uh, 1857 in India, uh, my regiment was particularly proud of the fact that, unlike a lot of British regiments who went around looting, pillaging and uh, raping after they'd uh, uh, subdued uh, the mutineers, um, my regiment did. They were always very solicitous and thoughtful for the civilian population. And I think those of you who keep an eye on what's going on in Israel and Gaza today will recognize that that is a very important part of military operations uh, if you want to uh, be a good fighting force. You have to take account of what effects you're going to have on the civilian population. So I learned a lot militarily from them uh, in terms of their skills and their outlook and the way they approach things. But I also learned a lot in terms of life skills because working very closely with them, 
uh, I also learned uh, how uh, well they approach things and the uh, extraordinary value system which they brought from their own culture in terms of helping each other. Uh, and that extended uh, to uh, helping their British officers as well. Uh, thank goodness uh, they were very uh, solicitous, particularly in the early days when I was still learning the ropes. Uh, I mean, for example, uh, I had to learn the language very quickly. And at the time when I joined, very few Gurkhas uh, spoke much English. Uh, and so I was uh, packed off into the Borneo jungles with a platoon of uh, 30 Gurkhas, none of whom really spoke uh, any English to speak of. Uh, and uh, I was thrown in at the deep end and told not to come back until I could uh, speak uh, reasonable Gurkhali. So I was out there for several weeks in the middle of nowhere. And sure enough, I came back uh, able to speak the language. So for those of you thinking uh, uh, of how you could learn a language, I wouldn't necessarily advocate going to the middle of the Borneo jungles, but I do think that to total immersion does work. So um, that's, uh, that's my, my lesson from that. Um, I also got to know the culture of the Gurkhas extremely well. And one of the most fascinating aspects I found was uh, the um, dichotomy that uh, uh, there was between Hinduism and Buddhism. Now, the, the British Army sees things in black and white, like most military organizations. And so from their perspective, uh, Gurkhas were Hindus. That's it. Uh, if you're a Hindu, you, uh, um, you, you needed a priest, and therefore the army issued uh, one Hindu pundit, one Hindu priest, uh, to each Gurkha battalion, that's it. Uh, in fact, uh, many of the Gurkhas were Buddhists, uh, particularly the uh, Gurum tribes. We, we recruited from the sort of west central part of uh, Nepal, uh, principally from among the, the, the Gurung and Magar tribes. And the Gurungs in particular uh, had absorbed a lot of Buddhist uh, thinking over the years uh, and uh, in private uh, were quite uh, happy to uh, uh, tell, tell you that they were Buddhist rather than Hindus and saw Hinduism as uh, uh, an aberration uh, and uh, to a great extent something they had to sign up to in order to get enlisted in the British Army because that's what the British Army said. But that contrast, I think, uh, brought out for me the ambivalence that there is uh, in that part of the world between uh, a lot of conflicting factors and also in emphasised the uh, extraordinary diversity, which many of these uh, organizations uh, 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 have in terms of their outlook, in terms of the influences which have formed them. So um, I learned a huge amount. Um, and I think as a last sort of lesson from uh, my time with Gurkhas, uh, I go back to the late 1970s, um, when uh, in Hong Kong, as uh, again, some of you may know, uh, there were huge influxes of uh, uh, illegal immigrants uh, brought about by uh, massive uh, 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 numbers of people trying to cross the uh, Chinese border with Hong Kong in the north uh, because of conditions in China and also because the Chinese authorities at that stage were prepared to allow it. So uh, literally hundreds of uh, Chinese people coming across there and hundreds, thousands of uh, Vietnamese boat people uh, crashing almost every night onto the uh, western beaches of Hong Kong. And so uh, we spent uh, the best part of uh, three years um, rounding these people up. And I think uh, there were two lessons from that that I learned. Uh, the first one was uh, that it emphasized for me uh, the enormous compassion which Gurkhas have for people like that, who literally were coming to Hong Kong with the clothes they stood up in and not much else. And the second thing I think uh, I learned, uh, and Sally and I were talking about this earlier, is the fact that um, it doesn't matter where you go in the world, and particularly in, in Asia, um, most people, the vast majority of people, are simply looking for security and stability in their personal lives. Very few people actually have an agenda based on ideology or anything else. The vast majority just want that security and stability uh, for themselves and for their families. And I saw at first hand uh, how uh, the Gurkhas uh, took account of that 
and also recognized that they were prepared to go one step further and actually help these people on their way through their compassion by feeding them, uh, by making them comfortable, uh, and by simply by talking to them uh, in whatever language they happen to be uh, uh, happen to be speaking. Uh, and I think that was a, a, an extraordinarily good life lesson for me, and I did my best to try and uh, try and emulate it. So um, I think only one one other point I'd like to make is the fact that uh, while I was with the Gurkhas, I, I also uh, was able to go to many other parts of uh, Asia um, and uh, on overseas exercises and training with other armies. So I was lucky to get an insight into several other cultures as well as the uh, Nepalese, um, which was, uh, again, fascinating. But um, all things come to an end. And uh, I was extremely fortunate that in my career, I um, rose up the greasy, greasy pole, um, slithered up the greasy pole, uh, got to the top and uh, eventually ended up uh, commanding my regiment, uh, which was an enormous privilege uh, and uh, the culmination of any uh, regimental officer's career. Uh, and having been top dog, that was it. Um, there was nowhere else to go in the, in the brigade of Gurkhas. That was the top job. And so after that, I could have stayed on in the army, but a number of factors um, suggested that I should move on to other things. Uh, I and mean, apart from the fact that from there on in, uh, the military secretary was obviously, because of my other qualifications, was obviously determined to stick me in a, a desk job here in, uh, in Whitehall, uh, which, you know, might have been a little bit interesting, but uh, uh, didn't really thrill me at the time. In addition to that, my children were becoming uh, coming to an age when they needed the stability uh, for their secondary education. And above all, my long suffering wife, uh, who uh, in 18 years of marriage had lived in 18 different houses around the world, which must be some kind of record, uh, deserved a bit of security and stability of her own. Uh, and so um, I, uh, after much heart searching, decided to jump ship and move on to pastures new. So I, I moved across to IBM uh, because I was fortunate enough to have technical qualifications which... Uh, endeared me to them. Um, I was also very lucky that uh, I, they quickly spotted my, my sort of uh, uh, very diverse background and therefore um, put me into global roles, which meant that I had the opportunity to um, uh, not only see a lot of the world, but also maintain my connections with uh, Asia. It was a very different environment. And uh, I'm sure you'll appreciate that uh, IBM, being a, a corporate organization, uh, is all about money. And so uh, I spent most of my time in Asia from there on in, in the main centers of population, dealing with uh, major financial, uh, and industrial and manufacturing organizations uh, that could pay the literally billions of dollars that IBM demanded for its products and services. Uh, it, that was interesting in its own right, um, and I was fortunate too that I managed to uh, play hooky from time to time when I was traveling around uh, and go off and see other parts of the countries I was visiting uh, uh, and um, you know, experience that at first hand as well. Um, I think two particular things I, I draw out of that. The first is that um, I, uh, at one stage, latterly, I had a team of uh, about, uh, one of several teams worldwide, but I had about... Uh, 250 engineers based in the city of Chandigarh in North India. Um, they were mostly Sikhs. I'd not come across, uh, across Sikhs uh, en masse before. And it was a wonderful uh, insight into uh, the very proud uh, and, and very capable approach which uh, the Sikhs have towards their lives. Uh, I learned a huge amount from them uh, besides you know, respecting and admiring uh, their skills as engineers. Uh, I also had a, a large team in China. Um, that wasn't quite such an enjoyable experience in uh, that we had uh, some fairly significant communication difficulties. Uh, at that time, uh, the engineers in China were technically good, uh, but unlike um, most other engineers in the information technology world at the time, uh, they didn't speak uh, particularly good English. 
And uh, my rather basic uh, Cantonese that I picked up from my time living in Hong Kong uh, simply made them laugh. Uh, it would, you know, I, I had a, a Cantonese being a dialect of Chinese. They only understood about 30% uh, of what I was saying and, uh, uh, you know, tended to be grinning from ear to ear when I was talking because of the, the, the weird accent that I had uh, compared to the uh, Putonghua that they were speaking. So um, it wasn't, um, you know, in, in entirely a satisfactory experience. But again, it brought home to me the enormous contrast uh, between the different parts of Asia uh, in ways that you perhaps sometimes uh, might not expect. So um, that was IBM. Uh, and uh, I continued with that job as a, as a wage slave uh, until I uh, finished in 2018 uh, and uh, retired from full-time work. Uh, since when I've kept my uh, connections with Asia, and as uh, Adrian mentioned, I've uh, also um, uh, built on those relationships by becoming uh, the chairman of the Britain-Nepal NGO Network, which is an umbrella organization trying to bring uh, non-governmental organizations, charities together, British charities, uh, to try and get them to collaborate. Uh, the founder of uh, Brango, as it's known, uh, worked in the sector for many years and identify that um, the um, British NGOs in Nepal uh, sometimes worked enormously inefficiently to the extent that you could have one village in the hills where one um, charity might be building a school at one end of the village, another cha different charity could be building another school at the opposite end. Uh, clearly a ridiculous situation where the two of them should be talking together, pooling resources and making far better efficient and more efficient use of them. Uh, so it was really on that sort of premise that uh, Brango was formed and uh, it's uh, it's been flourishing. We have uh, uh, something like uh, 450 associates um, uh, now uh, linked into to Brango um, with uh, a core of about 65 fully paid up organizations uh, who are the sort of central central membership. And there's a very rich exchange of information on all sorts of levels about what's going on, what they're doing, uh, the various policies affecting non-governmental organizations in Nepal and so on. So I keep my hand in. And uh, I'm also trustee of various uh, other trusts related uh, mostly to uh, mostly to Gurkhas in Nepal. Uh, so I'm very fortunate that I'm able to um, keep my, my links going. I think I'll stop there because uh, that has, as I said, has been a very quick gallop through some of the things that I've done. Uh, just in closing, I think I would say uh, that my overriding uh, impressions of Asia are of this tremendous richness of culture the tremendous diversity, the tremendous contrasts that there are between all sorts of different uh, aspects of, of, of what goes on there. So if you are thinking of uh, moving out into the world, uh, I can strongly recommend uh, Asia as a part of the world, which will not disappoint you in terms of the interesting and a, a lifelong fascination with everything that goes on there. So good luck. Thank you very much indeed. I'm very grateful to our next speaker, Sally McDonald, who <clears throat> allowed her arm to be twisted at 36 hours notice to um, step in and talk as um, <clears throat> Ran Chakrabarti couldn't get here from, from Belgium. Now, <clears throat> I mean, Sally had little choice really but to agree since I've known her husband for the best part of 65 years. Um, She's got a long and distinguished career in finance, working extensively in, with, and around Asia. She's currently a senior director at, at JP Morgan on their Japanese Investment Trust. And she's also <clears throat> a trustee of the Helping the Burmese Delta Charity. So again, you know, you put in, you take out, and you put in. Sally, thank you very much indeed. Adrian, thank you very much for that very kind introduction. and. Please forgive me, any of you, if I um, mentioned things that have already been talked about earlier on today, and I, I know I'm going to cover some of the ground, some of the ground that Nick's just, just covered. Um, so I'm talking about working 
with Asia rather than living in Asia because I have never actually lived in Asia because I have family all over the region and it's quite something being mobbed every time you go to a, a region when all the family are there, but also for cultural reasons and um, uh, family uh, commitments over here. I never actually lived there, but I travelled there between two and four times a year for the last, uh, well, more than 30 years. So who am I? I think Adrian gave me a little bit of introduction there. Um, I'm a non-exec director now, uh, which means that I don't actually take the decisions any longer. I make sure that other people are taking the decisions within the law and uh, as they should do and looking at the strategy of where things go in the future. Um, I worked as a fund manager for almost 40 years. Hands up anybody who knows what a fund manager does. Good, so hardly anybody. So what fund managers do, it's a part of finance where we go out all over the world and we look for companies that might be a good investment for, for the people who are investing with us. And that might be your life insurance policy, it might be your pension, it might be your personal savings, it might be any money that you want to set aside to, for a particular uh, objective. Somebody has to make that money work and that's us, the fund managers. And I started off, I did seven years looking at UK markets and then I switched to Asian markets, and I'll come on, come on to why I did that uh, anon. And as you can see, my work has taken me really all over the Asian region. So, as an Asian fund manager, the job was to go out and find companies whose growth prospects could give a return to shareholders, to unit holders, to anybody investing with me, that would be strong and appropriate for what they want, the right amount of risk and the right amount of time span and so on. And so that involves finding the companies, first of all. And it could be anything, anywhere within the remit. So my remit was everything east of Pakistan everything east of Pakistan. That is a huge region. 15,000 listed companies in that remit, 4,000 alone just in China. But when I started, there wasn't a single listed company in China. I have seen the listing of every single company in the Chinese market over my career. So I've, I've looked at these companies and you put them together in a way that you hope will provide a balance. So you want a company that's going to go up in good times, but of course, when, when bad times come, that company probably goes down. So you want a different company that goes up in the bad, bad times, and that probably doesn't do so well in the good times. Together, those make what's called a portfolio. And those portfolios are what you pay your managers to try to put together. I was also a charity trustee for a little tiny charity called Helping the Burmese Delta. I just stepped down in December, actually. Just four people, two in the UK, two in Myanmar, absolutely minute, with finances that were are hand to mouth every minute of the day. That charity built 36 primary schools, one middle school and one high school in a period of 10 years. It trained more than 200 traditional birth attendants to help people all, all around the Iowadi uh, division of Myanmar and set up a livelihood scheme as well. There is an enormous amount that you can do with very, very small resources. So what's my office like? It's quite diverse. So at the bottom, you'll see the bottom on this, this uh, six um, uh, set of photos, you'll see the type of workshop that people generally start at, uh, start at in Asia. Those, these particular photos are from Indonesia, actually. And there's a guy beating something with a big bit of metal. He's got a roof over his head to, to do it under, so it's not, you know, he's, he's not inundated when it rains. And his aspiration is really to get from there to the, the top right picture 
uh, on that same set of uh, pictures, slightly bigger workshop, nice, you know, more stock and something else to sell. From there, the aspiration is to go to a little, a little premises with concrete walls. And in, you then see a picture of me with the management of an industrial estate as in Surabaya in Indonesia. And we were talking about how this industrial estate might develop, what type of companies could come in, how it can help to grow the local economy. And there's the plan you can see bottom left here with which companies were going to uh, occupy what parts of the industrial estate. And there's a, a finished factory. That's all in Indonesia. Top right is the port in, uh, in Yangon, and that's in Myanmar. And the bottom right is me standing on the roof of a, a, a semiconductor factory in Malaysia. And a bit more about Asia, a bit more of my office. Here's my office in Tokyo, JP Morgan. Uh, it's me in the Singapore, in Singapore airport. This is Singapore, my office at Fidelity in Singapore. These are shopping, uh, shopping malls in Asia. If you're an investor, of course you invest in shopping malls as well. And then uh, I think these are houses in, that uh, looks like uh, Nikko in Japan, I think, up there. And of course, there's always the office in the UK, <laughs> which really does look like this. There's no possible way you can see me over the piles of, piles of paper in my office. So if you want to be a fund manager, what do you need to do? Well, can you write well? Do you do history, English, any essay subject? Because that's going to be necessary. If you want to write a report, you need to, have to know how to structure an essay. You want decent understanding of basic maths, solid stats. You need to be able to listen quite carefully to everything that's being said and pick out what's important. Think logically, follow a story all the way through into its conclusion. Any degree at all will do. If you're going to invest in an engineering company, having an engineering degree means that you will understand what that company is telling you better. If you want to have, if you want to talk to somebody in, oh goodness, um, I'm trying to think, uh, in uh, uh, a biopharmaceutical company, having a, 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 a any, any kind of science degree is handy, but actually arts degrees are very, very helpful. Unusual degrees help you stand out and they give you a different point of view and that's valuable. Languages are tremendous for pattern recognition. I've done almost 40 years in financial services now. My degree was classics. I did nine ancient languages at university, mostly squiggly, and that's quite handy because I learned more squiggly languages in Asia when I was there. And actually I did six years of, of uh, Burmese here at SAAS. Um, so they're fantastic for pattern, rec pattern recognition. And if you join a financial firm, you're gonna to have to do more professional exams. Anyway, so I was doing I did seven years in the UK. Why did I suddenly change to Asia? Well, I was headhunted. Somebody came up and said, what about it? What do you think? It is an absolutely phenomenally exciting and intoxicating area of the world. I'm sure, I hope you've had the impression so far today. And at this time, which is a long, long time ago, People, people viewed Asia as a bit, oh, you want to, a bit, why do you want to go there? There's not much to invest. Oh, you know, financial career, terrible. And I thought, well, I've got, I've got a load of friends there. I've got a lot of family there. And, and the person who was just about to be the best man at my wedding and actually didn't manage to be the best man at my wedding <laughs> because he, would, he, he snuck off to the Karakora Mountains instead, and so we had to choose my Singaporean cousin to be my best man instead, um, was, you know, it was one of the reasons why you know, Asia didn't seem that scary to me at all. Um, so much history, culture, languages, and of course, the food. Nobody can say they don't like Asian food because it is so diverse. There is so much stuff. There are a few things that you might not like, but... Uh, and so... I give you a lovely quote, which I'm sure you all know, from Robert Frost, saying, it's from his, his uh, poem, The Road Less Traveled. 
I shall be telling this with a sigh, somewhere ages and ages hence, two roads diverged in the wood, and I, I took the one less travelled by, and that has made all the difference. And I have no sighs, I have no regrets, because Asia is absolutely the love of my life. So what will you find in Asia? So first of all, and I'm sure people have emphasised this to you already today, it is really big. I mean, how big? So it's about a third of the Earth's surface. It's about 45 million square kilometres in size. And that's just, <laughs> just that's just the landmass. That's not including any of the, you know, the islands and, and, and what have you. You've got 2,300 languages minimum in the Asian region. You know, so, yeah, sure, choose, you know, choose an Asian language. There are plenty to choose from really lots to choose from. There are more than 300 in China alone. Uh, there are at least 120, and I think the other, other counts put it more like 200 and something in India. Um, and it stretches from the Arctic, from the Arctic Circle, all the way down to the equator, equator and further. So there's no, you know, you can't possibly say, oh, I don't like it because it's too hot. Go somewhere cold. Plenty of cold places in Asia. If you like, don't like the cold, go somewhere hot. <laughs> There's, lot, there's everything there. The, the diversity is extraordinary. And I think in the West here, we have this perception that Asia is quite poor and quite backward economically. And that, that is true in some countries. And it remains true in some countries, but it is absolutely not true everywhere. There are phenomenally wealthy countries that are phenomenally well-developed with most exciting cultures. Um, Nick mentions about you know, religions and, and, and the whole spread, you know, panoply of religions across Asia. Uh, I think there's, I, I believe that every single religion on the planet is represented by quite a significant group of people in Asia. And there might be one or two that I've missed that aren't, but certainly, I mean, Yes, Christianity, Islam, uh, Buddh Buddhism, uh, animism, uh, Hinduism. I'm just trying to what I what, what I missed in terms of major religions. I mean, just it's all there. It's absolutely all there. Um, business is generally done in, of course, the local language in whatever country, but also in English because English is, is a unifying language for business everywhere. So. If you love the idea of Asia, but you're kind of a bit iffy on the whole language thing, actually, that's not a problem. It's really not a problem. Um, I want to talk also about the diversity in, in science and technology. So we think of Asia as being less advanced than us te technologically. <laughs> not a hope, not a, some countries, yeah, okay. But actually, Asia is way ahead of us on, for instance, 3D bioprinting. I chaired a conference on 3D bioprinting back in 2014, where companies from China and Korea are leading the world in 3D printing human body parts. So next time you have a broken leg and it needs to be replaced, or you need a new, uh, a new part of your body, it can be 3D printed now and, it, and that reduces your time in hospital, increase, increases your opportunity for survival and better recovery. And Asian companies lead that. Um, in terms of other technologies, semiconductors, you've probably read all over the papers, Asia is far ahead of the West in terms of leading edge semiconductors, TSMC in Taiwan, Taiwan's uh, semiconductor. Is the only country in the world, only company in the world, capable of producing computer chips at just three nanometers. So Samsung is on, on about five. Intel is languishing way up the scale, I think something like fourteen or something. And uh, Micron and the others are, are, are not even close. So they're far and away ahead. Um, Looking at the companies that you see, when I meet when I meet companies as a fund manager, you go and you talk to the board, you talk to the, the chief financial officer, the managing director, the founder, 
every one of them are run by really switched on, intelligent, engaged people. It's so exciting. It's absolutely intoxicating. Now, Asian students, they travel the world to study. These, this data is from UNESCO. And the arrows show you where people are going, where they're, they're heading for, all, for their studies. Now, actually, that's not terribly um, visible on this, uh, on, on this chart. There's some reproduction here, but China is sending, is sending its students literally all over the world to study. And so China is gathering an understanding of the way that the whole world thinks, and that gives it a phenomenal advantage. South Korea is too. They are also sorry. The very fine arrows have not come out on this um, on this uh, 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 slide at all. But, um, South Korea is doing the same. For Western students, we tend to America sends most of its students, as you can see, to Europe, and a couple of others to English speaking speaking companies, uh, countries, and a few to Japan, and the UK, yeah, not much better to be honest. We tend to send them to America, to Europe and to Australia, and just a few go out to study in Asia. But there is an opportunity. If you want to, to earn money for the rest of your lives, being unique at what you do, being the road less traveled, is the way to have people coming to you and saying, I want to hear about your expertise, tell me more. And Asia is absolutely a, an untraveled area in terms of study. Um, any drawbacks? Well, okay. Attitudes to women vary. They vary everywhere in the world. I'm not going to pretend that there are not problems for women in Asia. I've travelled on my own in Asia for, I'd say, just short of you know, 30 years. All right, so just more than 30 years, or just short of 40 years of, of uh, farm management work. But the world's changed a lot. I was the only female working in my entire company for most of my early career in various different comp companies in the UK and then in global companies. And I've worked for UK companies, French companies, Canadian companies, uh, American companies, Japanese companies. Um, it's a whole variety of, of different companies. And frankly, women have had a pretty tough time in the last 40, 50 years of work it's improving. It's, get, it's, it's definitely getting better. If you're good at what you do, you will be fine, whatever. Prepare well and attention to detail. I said I love the food in Asia. There are exceptions. <laughs> there are exceptions. And Indochina, particularly Cambodia, they really are very fond of fried tarantulas and it's just not my thing. <clears throat> and then of course there's the jet lag as well. So, I think you probably gathered by now that my heart is in Asia and really strongly. This quote is from Kipling, but I, I feel it every day. If you've heard the Easter calling, you won't never heed nor else. Thank you.